Thank you very much, Alan. Well, I'm very honoured to be asked to give this lecture, uh, and I should emphasise at the beginning, this is very much a, a personal view. Uh, <clears throat> uh, but I um, have to acknowledge that some of these views came out of um, the very stimulating environment of early medieval studies at the University of Glasgow, where we have people both in archaeology, Celtic and Gaelic, and history. People like Catherine Forsyth, Stephen Driscoll, uh, Professor Robert Brune, Thomas Clancy and Stuart Early, as well as a large number of postgrads in our own department. And you'll be hearing from many of these people uh, throughout the conference. <clears throat> but however much I've, I've uh, discussed this with, with people, it's very much my own view. <clears throat> and uh, the starting point, <clears throat> we can start. To my talk, really, was a review by Richard Hodges uh, of the uh, Denad publication, which Alan mentioned. <clears throat> and in it, he says, Northern Britain was marginal in European terms, had an Aboriginal level of material culture. These regions failed to significantly engage in the post-Roman rebirth of Europe. <clears throat> well, <laughs> a slight frizz on this around the room. <laughs> <laughs> How can he? How can he possibly say that this is a, a, a society which has produced artifacts like this? <clears throat> well, he's not alone in this view. Um, Chris Wickham, in his monumental survey of early medieval Europe called "Framing the Early, Mid <clears throat> early Middle Ages," uh, <clears throat> and uh, I really respect Chris Wickham's work. He's a, a historian who uses a lot of archaeological information, but he specifically excludes Scotland <clears throat> from that survey. And the only two other areas in Europe which he, he treats like that are um, <clears throat> Bavaria and Saranesia. So um, I don't know if there's anybody from Benghazi or Munich here. <laughs> Maybe not, but we're all equally oppressed, I think, by that <laughs> statement. <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, indeed, the um, <clears throat> The publication on 50 years of medieval archaeology, medieval archaeology by the Society of Medieval Archaeology barely mentions Scotland at all. <clears throat> so out there there is this understanding that, that Scotland is not really important in Europe and <clears throat> I, I want to look at that uh, today uh, and I, I hope to show that this is an old trope, an old, uh, an old song if you like, and to try and offer an alternative view. So what I'll really be doing is <clears throat> talking a little about these visions of Scotland as being in the periphery and then prevent, uh, <coughs> present a, a view from the periphery, if you like, my view of what's going on there, in contrast. <clears throat> and just taking this uh, vision theme a bit too far, maybe, talk about how some of these visions of, uh, of the periphery have caused distortions of our interpretation of the archaeological evidence. And again, just briefly talk on artistic vision and how that might help us redress some of this balance. And finally, be talking about um, <clears throat> the idea of um, <clears throat> visions and uh, liminality, this idea of <clears throat> the relationship between uh, innovation and vision and the periphery. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> if we look back to classical times, this is the classical view of the world might not be immediately obvious, but um, uh, believed to be three continents, Asia, Europe and Africa, and they're surrounded by the ocean. <clears throat> and these bits in the middle, that's the Mediterranean and the Red Sea and the Black Sea, basically, to divide up those continents. But the important thing for this is that it was believed that the ocean surrounded the whole uh, <clears throat> of the habitable Earth. <clears throat> And Britain, as a place in that ocean at the very edge of the habitable world, had this sort of uh, resonance that we use today for, or we used to use for Timbuktu, you know, somewhere incredibly remote. <clears throat> and these lands were as far as you could go without <clears throat> falling into this abyssal ocean. <clears throat> and the Roman conquerors of Britain saw uh, the Arcades, the Orkneys, as, as the furthest habitable part of the world, and therefore they. <clears throat> claim to have com conquered them to show that they would uh, actually symbolically uh, <clears throat> that the empire ruled the world, the entire known world. <clears throat> so this view uh, continued into Christian times but was adopted and enhanced and this is uh, just a map based on Isidore of Seville's 7th century 
account of the world. And again, difficult to understand that this is the Mediterranean with its islands. This is Spain here, which is just about recognisable. And Britain is up here, <coughs> Britain and Ireland, these islands off the coast of Europe. <coughs> but here, uh, the concept of the ocean was adapted because in the Old Testament it's seen as the realm of monsters and demons, an untamed region outside the civilised world. And therefore it was seen as a suitable site for spiritual warfare between good and evil. And you only have to think of, for example, <coughs> uh, Columbus miracles of calming the waters <coughs> or the search for a desert in the ocean by early, <coughs> uh, early monks. And so, for example, <coughs> Patrick says that uh, <coughs> Ireland was at the furthest extent from where the gospel was first preached. <coughs> Excuse me. And <coughs> Adamnan, who will hear, a bit about, described Iona <coughs> sorry, as at the remotest ends of the earth in the 7th century. <coughs> and this view continued into the Middle Ages. Oops, I'll just go back a second. Um, Geraldus Cambrensis um, <coughs> compares Henry II in the 12th century to Roman emperors because he rules Britain as far as the Orkneys. <coughs> when we turn to more recent times, <coughs> uh, even in post-medieval times, uh, the idea of Scotland as being remote and inaccessible uh, is, is a constant theme. This is uh, Johnson's tour of the Hebrides. The Highlands and Islands are equally unknown to, <clears throat> as to that of Borneo or Sumatra. Of both they've only heard a little and guessed the rest. Uh, <clears throat> of course, with the uh, antithesis of the, uh, to the Jacobite rebellions, that produced an idea of the Highlanders as being Here's a good example of Thomas Pinkerton in the late 18th century, an, Ever <coughs> an Edinburgh historian. The Celts have not yet advanced even to the state of barbarism. They are incapable of industry or civilization, fond of lies and enemies of the truth. For the Celts were so inferior a people being to the Scots as a Negro to a European, that was all history shows, to see them was to conquer them. <coughs> uh, <coughs> again, you can see, <coughs> I hope, uh, a slight element of racism there. <coughs> <laughs> but this is a, a continuing a continuing story, and I don't know how much this influenced people like Richard Hodges in, in his view of, of, of the periphery of Scotland. But even today you can see similar things. This is a cartoon in the Guardian. I should explain to people from abroad that the, the Guardian is a very liberal, uh, <clears throat> a left-wing newspaper, and you can't imagine them doing this really uh, if it was the people of South Sudan voting in a referendum. I'm sure they didn't. Uh, <coughs> so these <coughs> attitudes I'd like, th those are views of the periphery. <coughs> so I'd like to turn now and uh, present a view of what was happening on the periphery, looking at it. And the way I want to do this is to compare what's happening here with what's going on in what's seen as the core of early medieval Europe, the Carolingian Empire. <clears throat> and so I'll be comparing the material culture of both areas. <clears throat> and I'll start off by looking, as I have already, at the illustrated manuscripts and the, the story of the evolution of these manuscripts, the, uh, <clears throat> the explosion of innovation in the 7th and 8th centuries, well known, I'm not going to repeat it here, but you end up with this amazing um, initial letters, which occupies the whole page here, and it, I don't know if you can all see the detail, but if I blow it up a bit, <clears throat> astonishing um, <clears throat> complexity. This is what um, Umberto, Umberto Eco called ice cold psychedelia, <clears throat> and you can see what he's talking about this um, uh, constrained uh, madness, if you like. I don't know if the monks were at the magic mushrooms, but um, they were certainly. <clears throat> probably in some sort of altered state of consciousness, consciousness to, uh, to, to do this, but it, it results in this amazing, <coughs> amazing art. Now, at the same time, if we compare what was going on in the Carolingian Empire, there's a similar initial letter from one of the manuscripts. <coughs> it has nothing of that power and innovation which we see going on in, in, <coughs> in, in Scotland. Similarly, one of the 
uh, major pages. Uh, this is the one introducing St. Matthew, and there's a similar one from Carolingian manuscript. You know, it's pretty, it's, it's competent, but there's no power to it at all. There's no, no innovation. <clears throat> if we look at uh, metal work, <clears throat> this is the Hunterson brooch. Uh, it's difficult to find the equivalent metalwork of this period um, <clears throat> because not much survives, but there's an example. Again, it, it's, it's competent and <clears throat> well-formed, but it doesn't have the level of complexity. Uh, I don't know, this is the back of the hunters and this is the back of the Tara brooch, showing the, the enormous <clears throat> skill and artistry that's gone into production of something like this. You just don't see that on, on these continental pieces of metalwork. Now, even the most significant pieces, for example, this is the crown of Charlemagne. <clears throat> this is bling. I mean, it's bling bling, really. Um, <clears throat> but if you look at the level of workmanship, I mean, this is uh, the in the design and so on. It strikes me if you, if you gave an eight-year-old child uh, some cardboard and uh, gold paper and some glass stones and asked them to make a crown, it would be something like this. You know, it's not... Uh, it's not a striking piece of design. It's just designed to impress with wealth. <clears throat> Similarly with ecclesiastical metalwork, the Arda chalice, the only really <clears throat> similar things are things like the Tassilo chalice. Again, if you look at the detail, the fantastic uh, skill that's gone into this, it's nothing like that in this, in this chalice. <clears throat> Similarly with the reliquaries, there's our very own Monimus reliquary and uh, superb design. And here's one from, <coughs> uh, uh, from Carolingia. Again, it's bling, it's got gold and it's got jewels, but the design is, and the workmanship is very poor. Mm -hmm. Again, if we look at the, the, the high crosses, which uh, seem to have been developed in, in, in Iona, the west of Scotland, mm -hmm. uh, we can't compare those to anything because there aren't any. So there's just another one from Scotland. <laughs> um, there's nothing similar at all. Uh, the grave slabs, like Hilton of Cadwell, these amazing, uh, again, amazing works of art. Uh, this is uh, the best I could really find to compare with. Again, it's not the same standard at all. It's, it's nothing like it. And of course, the St. Andrew's sarcophagus, which Isabel Henderson described as one of the great works of art of, of Europe, is, uh, doesn't really have an, exem an exemplar in the Carolingian world. Um, this was the best one I could find, really. Very much cruder, <coughs> uh, though it is from an earlier period. So before you think I'm over-egging this quite a bit, it's certainly true that um, Carolingian Empire did have other types of artefacts where they, they showed outstanding craftsmanship, particularly in the field of ivories which we don't have in this, in this country. <clears throat> but uh, although these show a great deal of craftsmanship, they're based entirely on late Roman Byzantine models. Uh, there's no sign of innovation taking place here. Um, there's just a very nice comb, better than our combs, <laughs> definitely. <clears throat> so I don't want to say that everything is much better here, but <clears throat> there is a difference in, in the the degree of innovation and skill in, in quite a number of areas. But the thing we don't have in this country is the buildings. And this is Charlemagne's palace at Aachen. <clears throat> a great complex of buildings in, in deliberately designed to uh, mimic late Roman, <clears throat> uh, late Roman buildings uh, with a bathhouse and various other features. And the interior of the, of the chapel <clears throat> Uh, not just imitates late Roman forms, but actually incorporates large amounts of uh, late Roman stonework. For example, the marble columns, lots of the marble insects and so on, are all stuff that was transported from the Mediterranean world from Italy. <clears throat> now, this was a deliberate attempt to create a new Rome in, in the north of Europe, but it wasn't innovative in the sense that we're seeing in, in Scotland. <clears throat> The only thing we have comparable here is the Fortivi arch, which suggests that there was a stone building of some significance at Fortivi. I'll come back to that in later lectures. But I think it's this lack of buildings, maybe, that uh, influenced people like Richard Hodges, who excavated at uh, Butrint and San Vincenzo Alvortuno, uh, 
in his view that, that this area was uncivilized. <clears throat> but I want to move on now and look at another area rather than material culture, look at the economy. <clears throat> and this is definitely another area where uh, people have uh, suggested that uh, we were backward. <clears throat> In fact, Richard Hodges again uh, some time ago just described Ireland as a failed state in economic uh, terms, in a rather prejudiced term. <clears throat> but there's no doubt that Scotland didn't have any of the normal markers of a developed economy. Um, markets, merchants, towns and coinage. In fact, these don't really appear until the 11th or even 12th century in Scotland, <clears throat> well behind other places like England, for example. However, people were obviously aware of these things and interacted with people who, who used coinage and so on, but they never adopted them, <clears throat> and that's something we have to explain. But despite that, people in the Western Britain were pioneers in economic terms. This is a, a distribution of all the sites which have imports from the 5th to the uh, uh, 7th and 8th centuries and you can see it's widespread, this material is coming in widespread across all the areas here. And if we look at particular items like red slipped um, pottery, this, this one's from Carthage, <clears throat> and look at the relative amounts of this pottery you find in the Mediterranean and in Britain, it's very similar. <clears throat> this is not a, a, a small outpost of this distribution. And there's the, the route way which you can trace which this particular piece of pottery would take to get to Iona. <clears throat> and uh, alongside this pottery came late Roman amphora with its contents, wine and oil, for example. Uh, and here's just an example from, from Rhine, which you'll be hearing more about uh, up in the very, very northeast of Scotland. Oops, up there. <clears throat> And it, uh, this is what it would, this is what it would look like. <clears throat> and you can imagine the effort involved in getting that to Rhine because these, these things weighed at least 50 kilos when they were full of oil and, and wine. And it have to be brought up the west coast then either overland uh, up the east coast or up the Great Glen huge amount of effort involved in bringing this from its original source 5,000 kilometers away in southern Turkey or Cyprus. <clears throat> but the important thing is here that this trade shows that there were uh, very close links between these areas. <clears throat> and in the uh, succeeding period in the 7th century, a uh, different trade network comes up <clears throat> uh, linking these areas to western France, bring pottery which contained things like red dye stuff to dye the, uh, the cloaks of royalty uh, and pigments, uh, for example, yellow pigments for these colorings in, in the manuscripts like the Book of Kells. So all this shows that there was a great deal of movement between the two areas, <clears throat> between the continent and Scotland at this time. <clears throat> and the interesting thing about it is that it happens before this happens in, for example, England. Uh, so if we look at the 7th century, we have all this contact and trade going on up the west coast and perhaps there's only a small amount of material coming into Kent and um, the area around the Thames estuary at this time. <clears throat> and so just uh, another, I seem to be talking about Hodges a lot here, but <laughs> um, this was his map of trade in the 7th century and you can see there's something missing. All this stuff in the west is missing because it wasn't thought to be important, presumably. Uh, and so again, this idea that the West isn't important is, is impacting very much on the picture of people are putting forward of uh, connections at the time. So I want to look on, uh, move on now and look at the uh, intellectual economy, if you like, and, and look at learning and <clears throat> administration at the period. <clears throat> And one of the most important documents in early medieval Scotland is the Minigus Seneca uh, Bernalban. <clears throat> and this is a, an incredibly, um, uh, incredibly complex document, repeatedly revised and rewritten, and it's fiendishly complex to uh, interpret. But at its core, there's a civil survey of <clears throat> households, landholders and their wealth in terms of their client households. <clears throat> 
in early medieval Scotland. <clears throat> My colleague, uh, Professor Brun, has uh, <clears throat> been struggling with this for many years, but he, he now sees that there are two early strands in this, one in the mid-7th century and one in the mid-8th century. <clears throat> but the important thing about it is here we see the names of people who are not kings, and it's also talking about the possessions of these people. It's not talking about, for example, like the tribal hydage, um, talking about a whole people and the size of that people. It's an attempt to focus on individuals. And that is extremely innovative in Europe at this period. In fact, I don't know of any other uh, attempt to do this until much later uh, in, the, in the Norman period. <clears throat> the purpose of it is, is obscure, but uh, uh, Professor Brun suggests that um, it relates to periods of changes in the over-kingship of, of uh, Dalriada at this time and a, a necessity to, uh, <clears throat> to work out who was due what to the, the new overlord king. Mm. But the important point about it is that um, not just that it's innovative, but it shows literacy, record-keeping, and some sort of administrative development at a very early period compared to the rest of uh, continental Europe. Uh, the writing, rewriting and consultation of these documents presupposes someone there to produce, store and interpret them in a secular context. And uh, I previously have suggested that the, the Loch Lassen book such, such of, which is in a secular context and uh, from a site associated with the royal site of Denad, may have been the sort of place where documents like this were kept and carried around. <coughs> Uh, one other aspect um, of administration, if you like, I mean, that uh, idea of ordering the world, uh, which is well known here, is the, the fact that the monks in Iona started to record analytic year by year uh, <clears throat> contemporary record of events as they were happening from at least the 640s. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> that concept again was innovative and was uh, copied. Uh, all over Europe, in fact, uh, all over Britain and Ireland and Europe. But it doesn't seem to be widely appreciated that, as far as I'm aware, the earliest example uh, is the Iona Chronicle from, from these islands. <clears throat> and that leads me on, really, to looking at learning. <clears throat> Although we're very familiar with the idea of monasteries, uh, such as Iona, being centres of learning, uh, it's not really always appreciated just how much they contributed to the intellectual development of the wider European community. <clears throat> and there's a huge amount of new scholarship taking place, very large numbers of people, many of them here in the audience, uh, <clears throat> uh, who are looking at this issue. <clears throat> and of course we know that I, I, many scholars now accept that Iona was uh, the place where at least four surviving manuscripts were produced. <clears throat> and here they are here, and we've talked about some of them in terms of their artistic development. But I want to really talk a wee bit more about the intellectual development, the, the contribution to learning uh, which took place in Iona. And here's a list of uh, some of the major works which we know can be associated with Iona. <clears throat> and a number of them are associated with Adamnan. <coughs> um, Adamnan was... Um, and known to medieval commentators as the illustrious, that was his title, and he was the only Gael to be given this title in the medieval period, and it was a tribute to his uh, learning, <coughs> basically. And, uh, for example, his uh, De Locus Sanctus, which you could describe as the rough guide to the Holy Land, uh, an early version of that, <coughs> uh, <coughs> has been shown by Thomas O'Loughlin to be not just a, a purely descriptive account, but a, a, a very important liturgical uh, document where he's discussing the, the liturgy of the church. And <clears throat> it's quite um, astonishing to me that, that uh, in this document, Adam then uh, discusses the problems of Augustine's interpretation of the, uh, the problems of the inconsistencies between the four Gospels, the stories of the Gospels, and he presents his own view of how these differences can be resolved. It doesn't matter whether he was right or not, but what I think is really important is that he felt able to, uh, from his position of learning in this very extreme per peripheral, if you like, area, uh, to suggest alterations to one of the fathers of the church. 
he was confident enough of his learning and his ability uh, to understand uh, uh, the scriptures to do that. And similarly with his, his life of Columba, again a very complex document to, uh, compared to other <laughs> hagiographic accounts. It's a, uh, a very sophisticated document. He makes great pains to uh, for example, establish his sources and say what his sources were and how they can be believed. But it's also a very sophisticated document putting forward a, a very, uh, uh, both illustrating his, his learning in terms of uh, exegesis and, and, and commentary in the Bible, but also putting forward a very um, uh, sophisticated story, if you like, to his audience. <clears throat> And again, not so well known, but um, the, the Law of the Innocents, which Adamin was so uh, influential in setting up, uh, was the first attempt to, uh, uh, <clears throat> to look after the non-combatants in what was a very violent society, women, children and clerics, to make sure that they weren't attacked <coughs> uh, during warfare. And Adamin managed to gather together over 50 kings in, in Ireland and Scotland uh, to sign this document and sign up to it. Again, completely new idea uh, from this time, <clears throat> the first Geneva Convention, if you like. And I've already mentioned the Chronicle. Uh, <clears throat> and there's the collection of canon laws, the collection of Canonum <clears throat> Hibernensis, again, partly um, uh, created in Iona. And this was, again, innovative. It's the first time the canon laws had been collected together. It became a, a very influential document. It was copied for over four centuries and very widely copied throughout Europe. Uh, and then there's a whole series of poems that were published by Thomas Lancey and Gilbert Marcus uh, uh, about Columba and, and hymns and so on. Uh, very important in terms of literature of the time. So all these things show that uh, it was a very important intellectual environment contributing very much to the, uh, <clears throat> particularly from the 640s onwards, uh, it was a centre of innovation for uh, not just in sculpture and art and so on, but also in, in, in learning. <clears throat> so, well, does all this matter really? Well, I, I'd like to just move on now to give a few examples of how <clears throat> this, uh, having a distorted view of the importance of early medieval Scotland has been backward and influenced, has influenced some archaeological interpretations. <clears throat> I'll start with uh, some of my own work. When I started my PhD looking at imported glass vessels, it was known that these shards of these vessels occurred uh, throughout Western Britain not as many as shown here. Um, but the interpretation of them was that they were brought in as broken sherds uh, for melting down to make beads and trinkets as, as colored. <clears throat> and that the people in the West couldn't possibly have had complete vessels because they were, uh, the implication that was never actually stated was that they were too barbaric. <clears throat> and this is despite the fact that complete vessels uh, could be found all over Anglo-Saxon England, for example, at the same time in, in pagan graves. We didn't have the pagan graves in the West, but <clears throat> we just had these shards on settlement sites. However, I, I was able to reconstruct some of these, uh, <clears throat> some of these glass vessels um, <clears throat> and show that they must have been uh, in use as complete vessels on the site. And this is now this interpretation is now spread to all these other sites as well. And there's other places where you can show actual smashed vessels can be fitted together. <clears throat> and so we see uh, these sites throughout the West uh, have access to these very fine vessels. They are luxury vessels. Some of them are paper thin. The difficulties of transporting in this period must have been enormous without, without breaking them. <clears throat> and that's comparable to uh, things which were going on uh, throughout the rest of uh, Northwest Europe. <clears throat> And there's just an example of, of some of the different varieties of glass which, are, which have been found in Scotland. You can see it's a huge, <coughs> a huge variety of different types and colours and shapes of vessels which were 
used for uh, drinking in the feasting halls and, and possibly also in monasteries as well because we do find uh, fragments in, in monastic contexts and they may even, I'd like to suggest, some may even have been manufactured in these monastic contexts. For example, from Iona we have this twisted reticella rod which was used to make reticella glass vessels. I'll show you an example of one later. And from Tarbert we have a fragment of one of these vessels. And uh, again from Inchmarna, from the monastic school there, we have this piece which <coughs> looks like nothing very much, but it's actually <coughs> uh, the base of a vessel like this. It's the area where, <coughs> where all this, these reticella rods come together. <coughs> And I'll show you an example of what that actually looks like. But also at Whithorn we have these uh, fused glass vessels, uh, lumps of glass which are formed by just compressing down vessels which presumably were failed during, uh, during manufacture. <coughs> and so it seems possible that, uh, particularly given this distribution and the evidence for manufacture, because you don't use these rods for anything else except for manufacturing these vessels, <coughs> producing vessels such as this. This is the well-known one from uh, Valsgaard in, in Sweden. Valsgaard sits. <coughs> uh, but I think it's possible that things like this were actually being produced uh, in Scotland. <coughs> I said a lot about Iona. I'm going to say more about Iona now. <laughs> um, mentioned it several times. It's, it's been known for a long time that the the monastic valum at Iona was unusual. It had an unusual form because people assumed that um, the normal form for a monastic valum was circular, as it seems to be in almost every site in, in Ireland. And that was seen as a model which was projected onto Scotland. <coughs> for as the Iona one seems to be, however it is, uh, square or D-shaped or something like that. Well, the recent work by uh, the National Trust Geophysics work has, has enabled us to say a bit more about uh, the shape of the vallum. <coughs> this is the, the work, thanks to Derek Alexander for giving me this. And you can sort of see what's happening. This, this line is the, the line of the raised beach, the scarp line really, which the site's dug against. And there's a large bank and, and several internal ditches. That's, it's more complicated than that. That's just a rough idea to show you that it's roughly quadrangular and it faces onto this scarp slope and open uh, an open slope. <clears throat> and I say people look for parallels to this in Ireland, but <clears throat> in fact, <clears throat> uh, most of the other major monasteries in, in Scotland have a very similar form. So, for example, this is Fortingal, is the, <clears throat> the enclosures you can see in the aerial photograph there, they're just outlined to show them. Again, this a double enclosure, sort of D shaped quadrangular. Tarbert, again, there's an enclosure. In this case, the, the scarp is the, the edge of the, uh, uh, it goes down to the beach, the dunes. And this is St. Blaine's at Butte, again, the same sort of thing. So something going on here, and a uh, recent work at Fortivit, which I'll talk about on, on Sunday a bit more, there's also a, a ditch, a straight section of ditch there, uh, which seems to cut off this um, <clears throat> spur between the two river valleys, the Water of May and the, the Erm, and suggests that this was the actual form of it. And we have seven to nine century radiocarbon dates from the extant section there, near where that letter M is. <clears throat> so we can see a pattern here, and yet uh, people are always looking for circular enclosures. This is the, the site at Dunning, and a small excavation was done and a stretch of ditch was excavated. It was straight, uh, but uh, this circular enclosure was postulated. <clears throat> and we've done some work recently there uh, looking to see if this is true or not. And it, it seems, sorry, there was another side ditch there as well. It, it seems that this continues straight on. <clears throat> and. So by my interpretation of the enclosure here is that it follows the modern street pattern, something like this. And again, it borders onto a stream valley. 
And I think uh, this idea, this search for a circular parlour, for an Irish parlour, uh, has, has, has led to uh, a number of misinterpretations. This is Whithorn, and you're probably all familiar with the double, uh, double circular enclosure which uh, the reconstructions of the site show. It's all based on a tiny section of gully here, and this is a gully about this deep. <coughs> And in fact, when you look at any of the other areas where it might occur, for example, the new excavations here, it just doesn't occur. In fact, I don't think this is enclosed at all. I think this is purely, uh, it was specifically um, and explicitly stated as based on an Irish model, but um, I don't think it, is, uh, it exists at all. <coughs> However, uh, come back to why uh, the Scottish sites are different. I had a sort of epiphany. Uh, in fact, they're very like Hordom, for example, uh, Anglo-Saxon sites. Mm -hmm. uh, at the Iona workshop recently, because I went out one morning and looked at what you saw from the front of the monastery, and this is what you see. It's absolutely fabulous. Uh, um, and is this just a coincidence? I don't think so. I think this. The monastery, it could have been in many different places. It was deliberately placed here because of this absolutely fantastic view. And it's not just Iona. <clears throat> if you look from St. Blaine's, this is the view you see. Uh, look from Tarbert, sorry, I don't have a better picture, but you look across the, uh, the water to the Northern Highlands. And even in the inland sites, this is for Teviot, looking towards the Highlands, uh, this is the view you see. And I, I can't help thinking, you know, there's some aspect here of, of this, <clears throat> of the um, very famous line from the Psalms, I'll lift up mine eyes to the hills from whence cometh my help. Uh, and I think, even at this micro scale, uh, the attitude was outward looking. It wasn't just, uh, people in these sites were not just looking at their, their, own sin, <clears throat> their own sins, they were looking to the outer world. They had a viewpoint which, um, <clears throat> was physically and metaphorically outward looking. How are we doing for time? Hmm? <laughs> okay. Uh, we'll say more about it. It's on my mind at the moment. Uh, the conventional story of um, Iona is that it was destroyed in the early North period, the recorded raids in the early 9th century, many of them. <clears throat> However, new evidence and interpretation suggests that <clears throat> it really continued to thrive during this period. Thomas Clancy, for example, has recently shown that the story of decline and abandonment can't really be sustained from the historical sources. And exciting new evidence has turned up both from new excavations and old excavations. For example, new excavations uh, by Gard uh, at the end of last year produced this Hibernanos, extremely fine Hibernanos, pin, steatite vessels and uh, wet stones which all seem to be belong to the Norse cultural milieu. It seems to be that there was uh, Norse period occupation on the site. And these items from Charles Thomas's old excavations which are uh, beginning to be <coughs> a proposal is going forward to, to write these up, show that there were items, uh, extremely important items of metalwork from this uh, 8th, 9th 10th century period on the site. Uh, perhaps these are fragments of shrines, uh, <clears throat> perhaps in the process of being, being looted by the Norse at, at one particular point. But the point is that <clears throat> um, the site seems to have continued in use. In fact, most of the, the grave slabs from the, from the monastery belong to the 9th, 10th century. And here's just some examples of, of some of them. And for example, this one from the <clears throat> Uh, from the front of St. Columbus Shrine, uh, probably <coughs> uh, commemorates uh, a known bishop of uh, Iona who died in the late 9th century. What is he doing living there and being commemorated if the, the place was deserted? <coughs> Seems most unlikely. <coughs> so I just want to move on to a final short section. <coughs> and say something about artistic vision. We'll be hearing tomorrow uh, from the Glen Morangy project where they've been employing craftsmen and artists to recreate objects from the period. And I think that's a very important work that's taking place. 
<clears throat> and I've been working with a couple of artists uh, looking at how we might visualize this period as well. And I just want to give you a couple of examples because I think it's an important way of changing our perception of how we think of the period. So this is uh, Aaron Watson's view of Denad in the 8th century. And <clears throat> by using particular techniques of rendering and so on, he's producing an emotional impact, which I think uh, adds something very much to the rather dry reconstructions which we normally give to these sites. It gives the impression of what's going on, a bustling, important place. <clears throat> And uh, this is Portivit Pictisymmetry, reimagined by David Simon. Uh, and we, I'll talk with some of the evidence for this, but of course these reconstructions are entirely hypothetical. But what I think they do is illustrate um, uh, the idea of decoration and colour which would have permeate, permeated society at this time. It's very important for counteracting the very sort of black and white view we have of, of the period. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> I'm, I'm sort of conscious that the, the labours of the men of Tain are probably wafting into the back there and drawing people there. <clears throat> so I'll, I'll go into my final section now. <clears throat> so we've seen how in the, the uh, and, and look at this idea of vision and peripherality or liminality. In the Carolingian Empire, buildings, as we've seen, was one of the key modes of expressing material power. In Scotland, however, it seems to be the sculptured monuments which uh, preserve much the same function. And these were present not just in monasteries, but in the landscape. This is the Constantine Cross at Fortivia in situ. And it's seems to mark the boundary of the royal estate. This area you can see in the photograph is basically the, the royal estate associated with Fortivia. And so it mark, marks the threshold of the estate, <clears throat> mark the fact that you're moving into that territory of the king. And the other thing that was used at this period was the fine jewellery. Uh, personal jewellery was a means of expressing wealth and position in society. And both of these are much more intimate scale than the the huge buildings of uh, the Carolingian palaces. <clears throat> and it may be that this is just a, a smaller scale society. <clears throat> um, but certainly what seems to have happened in, in Scotland took a very different trajectory, for example, than from what happened in, in England. <clears throat> and I think we have to look and try and explain why that is. As I think I've shown it's important that from at least the early 7th century we see a process of innovation taking place in Scotland. This is innovation in the practical fields of, uh, for example, art, the development of insular art style at sites, uh, not just the monastic sites, but sites like Denad and the uh, Moat of Mark, important royal centres. Uh, in the field of sculpture, the invention of the high crosses. In metalwork, the complex, highly decorated brooches and ecclesiastical vessels. But also, uh, being at the forefront of new ways of learning, uh, <clears throat> canon laws, liturgy and exegesis, and thinking of new ways of ordering the world, annal writing, the civil surveys, the law of innocence. And throughout this period, um, <clears throat> Scotland was in constant contact with other areas, Ireland, Anglo-Saxon England, the continent, the Mediterranean world. And influences were absorbed and transformed into new art styles, new ways of thinking about the world. Well, I hope the evidence I've uh, presented has shown just how influential and important places like Iona were in the early medieval period in European terms. Uh, yes, we have to admit that Scotland didn't have the, the, the normal attributes of a, of a market economy, though uh, given recent events in the financial world, it's possible to see that as being a, a, a sane choice rather than an a, 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 an indication of backwardness. Um, however, I would like to suggest that it also may be it's the lack of a monetized economy which uh, perhaps contributed something to this. Uh, it may have resulted in the diversion of available surplus into the support of clerics, artists and craftsmen uh, with a resulting explosion in, in output from the later 7th century. And in terms of why this surplus was occurring, uh, there's also the, 
the factor I think was quite important was the introduction of oats as a major crop at this time, which enabled the exploitation of different uh, <coughs> uh, different uh, types of environment and were very suited to the, the wet uh, Atlantic climate. <coughs> But it, I'd also think that um, Geldham itself is a social system which privileged people of learning and people of high artistic skill. For example, a poet could have the same honour price as a king and a master carpenter could have the same honour price as a lord. <clears throat> uh, so I, I think that very much influenced um, <clears throat> the position of these people able to take on these extra resources and produce these wonderful works of art. And coupled with the fact that Scotland was at a, a crossroads, oops, this is gone again. a crossroads of cultural contact between Saxon, Irish, Pictish, <coughs> and continental areas, it's perhaps not surprising that innovation took place here. It may even be that the uh, the liminality of of the environment here. Uh, meant that people were used to adapting to different conditions and that all, the, all these factors together contributed to this innovation at the time. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> I know I've been uh, accused in the past by David Dumble of um, having a nationalistic uh, interpretation of the evidence. Uh, I suspect this is a sort of academic code for not being English. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Of course, English can't be nationalistic. Um, <coughs> I have to plead guilty, I'm afraid, of this dire offence. But um, I hope what I've been able to, here to do is begin to address a balance in response to some of these entrenched stereotypes which I described in my opening remarks. And so that uh, we can begin to appreciate the true role of Scotland in early medieval Europe. Thank you. Mm -hmm.